My next guest was also a 90s sensation in his role as Kyle Barker on the TV series Living Single. Acting is just one of the talents of Terrence T.C. Carson. He's also a dancer, a singer, and now a jazz club owner in Atlanta on Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, near Washington High School and the Atlanta University Center. That's where we went one-on-one. A great the building is being renovated, and T.C. Carson's dream of a jazz club is close to becoming a reality. Why are you opening up a jazz club near the AU campus in Atlanta? Well, a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, I want some place where I can go. And people my age don't have a whole lot of places where you can go and just relax and hear good music and have a good cocktail and not be, and actually have a conversation. And so that's what we're building here. This building, um, we want it to be a community center. So we got plans for a, a cafe on the other end where you can get um, fresh to cook and fresh uh, fish and meats. We're talking about a um, supper club upstairs where we can have theater and poetry, all of that. So to be a, a, spl- a place in the community where we can gather and not just um, cross generations. We're hoping to have some kind of um, culinary program with Washington High School over here so we can start teaching and funneling kids that want to cook into, into jobs and stuff where they can cook and get that kind of experience. So it really is about how we can serve the community with this building. But why Atlanta? Because you travel literally all over the world. Why not? But what's so special about Atlanta that you wanted to be here versus in your hometown of Chicago? Well, um, okay, let me tell you how I got here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so my mom moved to, to Ackworth and she lived out in Ackworth for about 10, yeah, 10, 12 years before she passed. And I came here and I ushered her through her transition. And after that, I left and I wasn't trying to come back to Atlanta at all because the memories of that whole, because people don't teach you how to watch somebody make their transition. Nobody tells you what that is. You have to experience it just been through it with my mother-in-law and went through it with my mother six years ago. See, so you understand. I understand. You understand. And I got back to L.A. and everything I thought was wasn't anymore. So relationship, uh, all my work dried up. Uh, I lost my house. Everything within a year after she passed, everything tanked. And I was in a friend of mine's house. I was staying in his um, guest room and I was on the floor stretching because the only thing I had was my workout. Every day I would get up and stretch and go work out. And I was on the floor stretching and I was like, okay, you gotta, um, what, what, what do I need to do? What do I, just tell me what to do. So go to Atlanta. So, I don't want to go to Atlanta. I mean, I just came from Atlanta. I don't want to go to Atlanta. Five minutes later, go to Atlanta. So, I don't want to go back to Atlanta. There's got to be something. And if I go to Atlanta, fine. <laughs> Fine, fine, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. The, two days later, I got a job. A job that paid me enough money to make the move. I got here and got another job that gave me enough money going back and forth to Canada so I could get my own place. So reluctantly, coming here was the best thing I could have done. And again, it shows that if you listen, <laughs> If you listen, you'll you'll understand what you're supposed to do. And so that's what brought me here. But once I got here, I realized that there's so much opportunity for us here. Um, But we're kind of not taking care of each other. Mm. T.C. credits his mother with his love for the arts. She worked as a seamstress and later a nurse's aide while they lived in the LeClaire Public Housing Project in his hometown of Chicago, Illinois. It wasn't what people um, think about when they think about projects. They think about high-rise living. And these were the low-risers. And it was more like a townhouse. We had upstairs, downstairs. There were two bedrooms. We were on the end, so I had a yard. Uh, They had contests. We had a clubhouse. They had beautiful lawn contests. Uh, They built us a pool. So we had a pool in the summertime. So it was really, you know, uh, aside from the occasional gang violence and guns and that kind of thing, um, it wasn't bad. It wasn't like living in Cabrini Green. It wasn't like that at all. So how did Miss Annie keep you 
from becoming a part of that other life. She showed me that there was a lot of other things available. Uh, every summer when she got her vacation, we would vacation in the city and we would get on the train every morning and go down and do something different every day. We went on architectural tours, we went to the museum, we went to the theater, we went to the ballet. She showed me that there was, hmm, it's gonna get me. Hmm. She showed me that there was something else. That there was something else. And she tried to show all of us. She, t you know, she would take all of us when she could, because I had cousins that lived out there as well. And so when she could, she would take us all, just so they could see as well. So you talk about really realizing your career was going to be in music in the fourth grade. <laughs> but I have a feeling that this music thing started before the fourth grade. Now tell the truth and <laughs> shut the devil. <laughs> Well, you know, if Miss Annie was here, she would tell you that I've always been a performer, even as a little kid. Like my uncles would say, get up and do that James Brown thing, boy. And I would get up and do whatever, you know, and they would fall out. <laughs> so I guess I have been, uh, it's been in my blood for a long time. And on your website, you describe yourself as singer, actor, dancer. Mm -hmm. Why is the singing more important to you than the other two? Um, singing is where I have the most control over what I want to give you. Acting, theater, everybody. Well, theater is a little like that as well, because once the director goes away, then the show is the show. But when you talk about film and television, uh, you can give all kinds of takes and think it's your best one. And then you look and they pick the one that was the worst because the lighting was right or the sound was right or, you know, all these other things were okay. So somebody else has a say over what your performance is. When I'm on stage singing, I do what I want to do. So you like being in control? I'm a Scorpio. You know we do. <laughs> <laughs> you know we do. <laughs> when you went to college, you said your mom took you to see architecture and all of that. You majored in architecture and interior design. Yeah. What were you thinking? <laughs> um, that was my fallback job. That was the thing that I figured, okay, you can get a degree in that. I didn't think to get a degree in music or theater because I didn't think I would make money in that area. But I thought, well, architecture, interior design, I can make money there and something creative I like to do. So we'll do that. So what lessons did you learn from learning about architecture that is synonymous with what you do now? Um, the design element for theater and for stage work, when I think about uh, who I am and what I do as a performer, it's more theater-based than club-based. Uh, it's great to sing in a jazz club, but I like a theater space where I get lighting and I get you know effects and I can really tell stories. You know, that's the space I think I, I work best in. And so I think the, um, the design part helps me craft what that looks like. Just like this space, I'm the designer for this space. And I have done everything from sewing cushions to painting uh, bars and staining chairs and all of that. And what about this gorgeous mural behind us? This is a friend of mine, Ralph Glenmore, Glenmore Art. And I asked him to create something that would be a moment in time for the space and something that would reflect um, a little bit of Atlanta history. So you see C.T. Vivian and you see John Lewis over here, but you also have Quincy Jones. You got Sarah, you got Miles and Dizzy and just the journey from past to future is what this represents. And he's a wonderful artist. Um, I'm just so happy about it. The colors, the vibrancy, I think it does a really good job of uh, letting you know what this space is going to be about. I'm a firm believer that you can make your money and still be of service to your community. And that's what we're working to do with this space. And we have another space uh, down the street on Brawley uh, called St. Mark's. And it's an outdoor venue. It's going to be 250 seat outdoor venue uh, inside an old church. Uh -huh. And it's beautiful. The acoustics are amazing. We've got historic designation, uh, the symphony assigned on. 
and it's just it's really moving forward quickly. So it's going to be a great addition to the neighborhood. My Your voice is one of those that is amazing to me because you can go from bass all the way up to falsetto, and it's a true falsetto. Did you take voice lessons? Um, I have studied. I, I did study some in college. Um, it's trial and error for me. A lot of it is just experimentation and figuring out, you know, what I can do, what, what it does do. And then can you do that on a regular basis? So is it just like a one-time thing? Some things are just a one-time thing. <laughs> you got to know the difference, you know? But I, I, singing is fun to me. Um, I'm not, I used to be concerned with trying to sound like what people expected me to sound like and what they thought, you know, reading different comments and that kind of thing. And then, I, you know, as you get older, you decide that, you know, well, that doesn't mean too much or nothing. And I'm just going to do what I do. And if you like it, cool. If you don't, yeah, that's cool, too. Stay off my page. <laughs> if you don't like it, why? I had a moment like that. Somebody was like, I don't like him. And I, don't, I, don't, I, don't. and I was like, you know, so check it out. I understand that what I do may not be for everybody. And that's okay. And if you don't like it, it's really okay. You don't have to watch it. But you did watch it, didn't you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> now, that voice of yours also, because you were just here uh, with the, the comic. The Comic-Con, yeah. The Comic-Con. Mm -hmm. And everybody was going crazy over you because you're the voice of Kratos. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How did you get into that? And it, it seems like it's something you really enjoy better than anything other than singing. I do, um, because you don't have to. It's not about anything other than what it sounds like. So you don't have to get dressed up. There's no <laughs> hair. There's no makeup. There's no lights. There's no cameras. I can show up in my jeans and my hoodie and just, you know, give the sound. And the musical, the musical part of who I am helps me with that part because you can hear, I can, I can hear the different rise and falls that they're asking me to do. And I started it um, by taking a class. I took a class. Somebody said, you should do voiceovers. So I was like, yeah. So I took a class um, and the class provided me a demo tape at the end. Shot the tape, got an agent, and been working ever since. TC is full of ideas and is working on a cooking show called Uncle G Daddy's Kitchen. Uncle G Daddy is a late night show with cooking. So it's a late night talk show with cooking. Oh, I love it. And the goal was to be able to provide edutainment. I don't think late night is curated for us. There's nothing that is uh, beneficial for our community. So what I wanted to do was provide a space where we could talk and we always talk around food. We always talk in the kitchen. And so to have guests on and performances on and people on that we don't normally get to see. And so we're shopping this now and hopefully this year we'll be able to get it on. So now that you're in this phase of your life where you're opening a jazz club, you're going to have a restaurant, you're going to be doing all of that. What is there left for TC to attain? Oh my goodness. There's so much stuff to do. There's so much stuff to do. Again, I'm looking for Uncle G Daddy to open up doors into my community so I can be more of service. Um, I still have not done my theater piece that I want to do. So we're working, you know, I want to do a curated piece for the theater. Uh, so I'm working on that this year. We're working on an album this year. What's the topic? I mean, how, what's the curated um, piece? I'm not sure yet. Um, we're talking, I want to talk to OK Cello about um, collaborating for, for a journey. I really want to create a journey. And that's the thing about um, when people come and see me, I realize I'm not a um, trick person. I don't riff and run and do it. But I really work to tell stories with the music. And that's what I'm hoping people get when they come and see me. They can actually take the journey and have a, a get away from what they have normally and just take this journey and be happy. What comes in your head when you feel like you need to sing and lift your spirits? Oh, it's usually just random scatting and 
just however I'm feeling at the time. How'd you learn to do it? <laughs> Trial and error. <laughs> it really is about um, mimicking an instrument. So, you know, when you hear people scat, a lot of times they'll, they'll scat to a horn. Yes. Or it'll be a guitar or sometimes a bass. Um, mine is more about a conversation. So I kind of go from different instruments in the process. So it depends on what I'm hearing as we're playing the music, that, which is why I love to record with people as opposed to recording separate. To me, when you're recording separate, you're doing your own little monologue and then somebody puts a monologue on top of your monologue. But when you record together, we're all having a conversation and it really is about the conversation. So scatting to me is about relaying a conversation to my audience without the words. Now you always say that, that, that the kind of jazz you do, yes, you do the traditional, mm -hmm. but you also like to take contemporary music mm -hmm. and give it a jazz flavor. Mm -hmm. I heard you, uh, I listened to you singing Ed Sheeran's song. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's had a totally different sound and feel. Sexier, actually. All right, come on now, watch yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, why take contemporary music and give it a jazz feel? We've been doing that. When you think about the jazz era back in the day, they always took contemporary music and quote, quote, jazzified it. So why not do it with, you know, stuff today? Okay, you know what I'm going to ask. <laughs> I want to hear you sing. I'm in love with the shape of you. We push and pull like a magnet do. And though my heart is falling too, I'm in love with your body. Last night you were in my room, and now my bed she's smelling like you. Every day they come in something brand new. I'm in love with the shape of 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 you, you, you. I'm in love with the shape of you, 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 you. <laughs> love it! Made my day. Oh. Thanks for watching. Now, you want to know who will be going one on one with me next? Subscribe now to Peachtree TV so you don't miss the next episode of Monica Pearson One-on-One. -on -One.